It's been an awesome conference so far. My opinion, it's been an awesome conference so far. I thank you all for coming. Uh, the last speaker of the day, and then, and then after he speaks, I'm going to close it up with a few announcements and things like that. Uh, the last speaker is the administrator of the Office of Technical Services in the Division of Planning. Um, I've known him almost since I, I got here. I've seen him speak before. He is uh, the coach of some championship basketball teams. He's the coach of the championship tech services team. Uh, you know him as Drew Williams. Hopefully the microphone is working pretty good. Yes, it is. First of all, good morning to everybody. I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you to Charles for um, giving me the opportunity to be here. Also, just want to give him a round of applause for what he's done so far <laughs> up in the last uh, three months or so. Um, not easy when somebody come calling your door at the uh, late hours and asking you to take over uh, IT. Uh, he's done a tremendous job with that. I told him uh, I can't recall over the last 20 some years where the CIO or the Department of Transportation has gotten this collection of folks uh, together. So uh, kudos to you, uh, Charles, and I appreciate you inviting me to do this. I'm very happy to be here this morning. Um, the world of transportation is changing. Uh, have you heard stuff yesterday from Peter and Drive Ohio talking about Thomas Connected Vehicles? You heard things about smart cities, all the different technology pieces that are going on. Um, the world of transportation is changing. And as such, we're going to have to be a team that changes with it. We're going to have to be the leaders that takes us into further into this 21st century transportation. And it is changing. Uh, really quickly, I'm just going to share with you, some of you already know, um, how vast of a transportation system that we manage. Some of you may not know, uh, but you know, Ohio is a top five uh, state in terms of transportation. Um, so as we go through this, some of you have seen this before. Uh, we maintain that many assets in terms of 43,000 miles of roads and bridges and uh, 14,000 bridges, 80,000 culverts. Um, a lot of people don't know 60% of the United States population, Canadian population, is within one day's drive of Ohio, which makes us very, very significant. There's a lot of movement of commodity that comes up and down through our, uh, our interstate and our highway system. So we manage a lot. Uh, in the Office of Technical Services, I always tell my staff, it's 125,000 public roadway miles. If you live in the state of Ohio, we probably inventory and record the street that you live on. That is very, very significant. 125,000 public roadway miles. That's not very easy. And we do that partnering with um, IT to be able to make that happen. We have the fourth largest interstate. So if you unfolded all these miles and linked them all together, you'd be able to go from California to DC two and a half times, okay? That's a lot of mileage that you have to maintain out there. Some other things that we are big at. You know, we're the second largest uh, bridge inventory in the entire United States. Second largest bridge inventory, okay? All these assets are very critical to what we do. Fifth highest vehicle miles traveled. That's a lot, okay? So we're, we're very, very large. Now, our tonnage in terms of what we deal with our ports, we're bigger than the uh, Panama Canal in terms of the amount of tonnage and, uh, of freight that we move on our shipping and our logistics. It's huge. That's huge. Larger than what they do in the Panama Canal. Also, we have our inland waterways that we do a lot of uh, movement of goods and things through also. So as they're rebuilding the Panama Canal, we're going to have more of an emphasis on our transportation system. Keep in mind, economic development is very key to this state. It generates jobs for us, prosperity for us. And so a lot of companies, when they come in here, they're looking for places where I can, A, ship. I can move from a ship to a, to a, uh, a vehicle, a truck. I can transport it to air, okay? So we're a triple threat. We're a triple threat type state, all right? The other thing about it is, too, a lot of people don't realize this from the railroad standpoint. We have more active rail lines than what they have in California. More active rail lines than what they have in California. We were very, very significant. If you ever go look up at North Baltimore, which is up near the Bowling Green area, 
Go on Google Maps and take a look at the enormity of that size freight facility, rail facility. All of that different traffic that goes all the way through there on its way to Chicago and throughout the rest of the United States. We manage that, okay? You help manage that. That's a big deal, okay? Also with airports, public airports, we have a lot. We have an aviation department out at Don Scott, which is a part of the Department of Transportation. So again, all of you in this room in some way, shape, form, or fashion play a significant role in that. And at the end of the day, our portfolio is about $115 billion worth of assets. That's huge that we manage. And we don't do it in isolation. It takes a team to do that. Now you heard them talking about autonomous connected vehicles. You heard them talking about smart cities. The other things that are gonna be significant going forward is resiliency. You're gonna to start to hear that. And resiliency simply means what happens if there's a catastrophic event that shuts your system down, your transportation system down? How quickly can you get it back up? It's no different than what you do with incident management and IT. The server goes down. How quickly can you get it back up? Well, what happens if I-71 shuts down? What happens if there's another big flood, the 100 year flood in and around Buckeye Lake? How can we get people moved out of there? How can we rescue people? Where are they gonna go? Those are the kind of things that we're talking about. Some of the incidents of flooding down in the southeast part of the state. How are people gonna be able to get moved around if all of a sudden the roadway is just not there anymore? How quickly can we get it back up and running? You've heard them talk about TISMO yesterday, probably with um, Mr. McGavin talking about TISMO and talking about incident management. How quickly, if we had a hazardous waste spill, can we get the system back open? Travel time reliability. Again, we're being competitive. Nobody wants to move to a state that's just got full of congestion. You can't get your goods through here in a quick fashion. All of these things are coming to bear. And then the biggest and most important piece, in my opinion, mobility. We service 5.5 million people who go to work every day on our roadway system. 5.5, okay? Not to mention the people who are just passing through, but 5.5, wanna get them there safely, wanna make sure that they'll be able to take care of their families, wanna get them there. School buses, human services. I'm very, very passionate about the military. I'm a military vet myself, I'm a Navy guy, okay? One of the things that breaks my heart is when I see people come back with missing limbs and arms and they can't get to a simple doctor's appointment after they've risked their life for us, okay? So I take that personal. That's part of what we do, that's who we are. So in order to be able to do this, we're gonna have to have a very, very effective team. We've gotta have effective leadership, we gotta have a strong team. This is the group in here, and some of the other ones that are not here today, but the group of people in here who are gonna make the difference going forward in the 21st century. We have to function that way, folks. We just have to, in order for us to be successful. And we're connecting the dots all the way around. Human services, all the way through economic development. It used to be transportation was just pavements and bridges. That's all we talked about. And pavements and bridges are important, as you saw from an asset standpoint. But quality of life is just as important. You've heard Director Ray say that we go to work not for the Department of Transportation. We go to work to take care of our families. Because I guarantee you, if somebody hit the lottery today, you're probably not coming back tomorrow, right? So you work to take care of your families. But at the end of the day, you are a public servant. You're a public servant. That's why we're here, okay? I want to talk to you about some essential elements for leadership that we're gonna to have to make sure that all of us have. Yes, Charles is your CIO, okay, he's your leader. But also, you gotta have leadership within your teams. Everybody can lead. He sits at the top as a CIO, but all, all of the people who make up the team, you can lead up, all right? You have great ideas. You have things that you know can make things better, okay? So first of all, I wanna talk about some of the essential elements of leadership. Number one, trustworthiness. Can we trust you? You know, I was told that trustworthiness, basically, the integrity is, what are you doing when nobody's looking? What are you doing when you're by yourself? What are you doing when you gotta make a decision for the team? What are you doing then? Trustworthy, can we trust you? 
okay? Can I hang my hat on what you say? My career is in your hands. Are you being an obstructionist and keeping me from promotion? Are you pushing me forward because you know I can achieve anything and be a better asset to the team? That's what leaders do. Credibility. Are you credible? Can I take you at your word? If you're telling me that my smoked pork tastes really good, is it really good? I think most people in the room who ate last night probably say, yeah, he's a pretty good smoker. Okay? <laughs> so he's pretty credible. All right? But that's an essential element of being a good leader. Can I trust you? And integrity and credibility goes a long way with that. Nobody wants to come here and stay in the same job all the time. Some people come here and they're comfortable with that. Some people are comfortable with that because they don't think they can achieve anything else. As leaders, our job is to provide that kind of environment that facilitates growth. Growth also facilitates innovation. And we have to have a lot of innovation going forward in the 21st century. Next up is self-awareness. What are you aware of? First of all, that's personal and self-awareness of those people around you, all right? We are a very, very diverse team. Whether it's race, creed, sex, whatever the case may be. The workforce of the 21st century is very diverse. Are you aware of the folks who work in your environment? Good leaders do that, you know? Where are they from? Were they born in the United States? Were they born somewhere else? Do they look at things a little bit different? How do you harness in that diversity? Diversity makes us stronger, makes us that much better. And good leaders who understand that take advantage of it, all right? I tell, I tell my wife all the time, she's a Northwestern grad, okay? And that's, they're supposed to be like really smart, and she tries to make me feel like that all the time, like I'm really smart. But at the end of the day, she brings a totally different uh, perspective than I do. So I noticed about a week ago, Charles, she left a book on my desk, and some of you probably who married me have probably seen it before. What is it, men are from Mars, women are from Venus? That's what she left on my desk, to basically indicate we're all bringing something a little bit different to the table. Diversity makes us better, all right? I don't want to work with people who are all just the same. Why? There's no innovation there. It's hard to be innovative like that. It's hard to grow like that. Everybody have a, has a different perspective, and they bring something different to the table. All right? Also with self-awareness is the communication piece. You have to be able to communicate. If you're going to be a strong leader, you have to be able to talk to folks. The worst thing that you can have is somebody you're working under who you can't learn from. And how are you going to learn from if they don't communicate? That's a tough, tough thing to do. So as leaders, I want to be self-aware. I want to be aware around me. I want to be aware of things that I have shortcomings in. Because as a leader, I need to get better also. But I also have to be aware as to what you bring to the table individually so collectively as a team, we can get better, all right? Harnessing talent. Humility. This is one of my favorites. Humble. Humble. Not about me, but it really is. It's not about me and my ego. It's not about me and pats on the back and all that kind of stuff. But it is about how I feel about you as a team. If I'm the leader, what do I feel about my team and the, the people that make up my team? How do I feel about them, all right? Am I looking for the pat on the back? Am I looking for the, you know, the feather in the cap? Or am I looking to advance us to be the best that we can possibly be, okay? Being humble, passion. One of the things I do when I come in on Monday mornings, I'm bouncing off the walls. If you ask my assistant Wilmer here, I'm bouncing off the walls. I normally get up at 4 a.m., I go to the gym, I normally run downtown Columbus. When I get to old dot, I'm literally bouncing off the walls. Now, don't come and see me at 12 noon. But at 7 a.m., 7.30, I'm bouncing off the walls because I'm passionate about what I do, okay? And it's not about me. I think that I um, uh, oversee some of the best people in the world in tech services. I think I work with some of the best people I could possibly work with in the IT people uh, in Do It. I think I have the privilege of being around some of the best teammates in the world at ODOT. I'm passionate about that. I'm also passionate about that 5.5 million people who go to work every morning. I'm passionate about those kids who go to school 
every morning. I'm passionate about those wounded veterans who need to get to their health and human services uh, and their services every day. I'm passionate about that. Leaders are passionate. If leaders aren't passionate, it does not create an environment that you can co uh, connect or communicate or collaborate. And if those things are stifled, innovation is stifled, all right? And I would tell you that you probably have an ineffective team. If you have an ineffective leader, they have to have a level of passion. Now really quickly, as Charles alluded to, I'm a basketball coach. I love basketball. I'm a passionate guy about basketball. One of the reasons why I got into basketball is because I wanted to do something for the inner city uh, youth in Columbus. That's the reason why I got into basketball. I didn't get in to try to be a high school basketball coach. I just wanted to help. Passionate about young folks, okay? That morphed into me being a high school basketball coach. And one of the things that happened to me back in the early 2000s, I um, had the privilege of coaching some outstanding kids, and still to the day, today I, I coach some outstanding kids. But I had this kid named Ron Lewis. Some of you who are Buckeye fans may know Ron, heard of Ron Lewis. But Ron Lewis was this kid, barely made a freshman team, worked his tail off, became a pretty good basketball player. So in his junior year, we got knocked out of the state Final Four uh, by Cincinnati Elder. We got knocked out of the state Final Four. They literally beat us up. They were just so much bigger than we were. And so that summer, we ended up playing a uh, summer basketball game and, and got to a championship. And we, uh, I, I drew up a last second play. We were losing the game, trying to see if we can pull this game out. So I drew up this play that required Ron Lewis to set a screen for another player, get him open, see if we can get a chance to win the game. You know, kid they were setting the screen for ended up being a McDonald's All-American, so he's a pretty good player. Ron kind of half-heartedly did what he was supposed to do. So I'm thinking that the kid is coming to me after the game and say, hey, coach, you know what? My bad, man. You know, I, I didn't do my job, whatever. No, Ron comes to me with the whiteboard what you see here, and says, if you have just got the ball to me, we would have won. If you just run this play, the play that I drew up, we would have won. Now, can anybody tell me what's wrong with the play here? The X's are defenders, the O's are offensive players. <laughs> There's too many offensive players. <laughs> You're only allowed to have five on the court at one time. Ron drew up six. So I'm looking at this thing like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well something's not right. Yeah, probably would work, Ron. <laughs> You're the sixth guy. <laughs> Maybe you should be the sixth man. So trying to get to him because he had kind of gotten to the point where he was getting recruited, he was getting letters from colleges, and you just couldn't get to him. We kept working with him, working with him, working with him. So one day in the fall that uh, year, going into his senior year, we were ranked pretty high. We told Ron Lewis that, uh, and the rest of the team that you, know, you had to do your conditioning. If you don't, you're not going to be able to play, blah, blah, blah. Kept working with this kid. Right before the season started, uh, Ron had you know, gotten a lot of scholarship offers, as well as some other players on the team. Ron comes up to us and says, hey, uh, um, I don't think I should start. Wow. You don't think you should start? I don't think I should start, coach. I'll come off the bench. Kid came off the bench. He averaged 15 points a game coming off the bench. We ended up winning the state championship that year. He was our sixth man. He ended up being all state, okay? He ended up being all state. And he learned a lot from that. He learned humility. He learned what it took to be an actual leader. It wasn't about me, it wasn't about him. Plus six players. Yeah, about him, you know. He learned that it was about the team. So he sacrificed for the team. I mean, I would beg him some games. Hey, man, I need you to start. No, because I'd rather come off the bench. You know, let Raheem start. You know, let him start. Okay, six man. That's unheard of. He's a six man in high school. He ends up being all state. He ends up going to OSU. And I want to show you a clip, because I, I used to talk to them about what now moments of being a leader and when your time comes. Just do your job. Do your role. And I want to show you a clip of uh, what happened. Um, if you can roll that, please. If you can, I think he's going to roll it. OK, go back one. OK, we'll go back. And this one. That button up there in the middle. Okay. 
Let's go back again. Okay, I'll go back. If you can click that button in the middle. Yeah. Ohio State's down by three right now. This right here was in the NCAA tournament. That's Ron Lewis. Now, if you can, I want to play that again, but I want to set the tone for that, I'll set that up one more time. If you just pause it for me, I'm going to set it up one more time. They were playing Xavier University. Thad Mata had become a, the uh, 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 basketball coach at Ohio State. Thad Mata used to coach at Xavier. He came from Xavier to Ohio State, okay? Thad Mata called me to come to practice one day. He had a problem with Ron Lewis. Ron Lewis was getting kind of going back into that, you know, I, me, you know, I'm the guy, whatever. And we talked about the fact of humility. Talked about the fact of what it took to be a leader. He's playing on the team with Greg Oden, number one draft pick in the NBA that year. And Conley, who just signed a last year $173 million contract for the Memphis Grizzlies. Those two guys were on that same team. Daquan Cook, who played for the Miami Heat with LeBron James and those guys when they won the championship. That's who was on his team, okay? So he finally settled into, okay, I'll just play my role. And I kept telling him, your time's gonna come. They're gonna need you. Your time is gonna come. And in this particular scenario right here, Xavier University was winning the game. They went to the free throw line, seconds on the clock, all right? Up three, they make a free throw, the game is over. All right, they miss a free throw. You heard the fan in the background screaming, foul, foul, foul. And then they went through, and he gets the play, he wins the game. Go run it one more time, please. You never know what's going to happen. Okay, where are we at? Hold on. Got to go back. Right there. <laughs> well, there you go, right there. Okay, he missed the free throw. Now listen to the fan. We all want to actually take the last shot at some point in time, but it, your time. Humility, being part of a team, okay? Being part of a team. We're not all called to be the best, but we are called to be our best as it relates to what we do, all right? Oh, and by the way, um, the little guard there trying to block the shot, he's about five foot six. The year I won the state championship, that was my point guard. That was the guy I was trying to set the screen for. He was supposed to set the screen for that game we lost. They ended up playing against each other in the NCAA tournament. And that was the last second shot, all right? I like this. Uh, Director Ray gave me a book uh, a year ago to read called Leave for God's Sake. Any of you uh, want a good read, I would suggest this particular book here. Um, but anyway, be intentional with your influence today. Every word, attitude, and behavior can either discourage or encourage. Be a light. Speak life and model the highest standard of leadership you desire to instill in others. Be intentional, all right? Be intentional, that's what leaders do. We intend some type of outcome. Be intentional, all right? Encourage, that's what leadership is about. I love this quote by Joe the janitor. I'll mention him later. Okay, now, instead of talking, giving you the essentials of good teams, I'm gonna tell you why teams fail. All right, I've had some teams that came up short, but I'm going to tell you why teams fail, and you can kind of see what these central qualities ought to be for a good team. Again, we have to have good leadership. We have to work on this stuff to collectively together. We're in this together. We have a huge, huge transportation system that we have to manage. Teams fail when you have poor leadership. You show me a poor leader, I'm probably going to show you a team that's probably not very good or going to fail. You show me a poor coach, I'm probably going to show you a team that's failing. All right? They're connected. Not only the leadership at the top, the leadership within the ranks. All right? It's, it's just, they're connected. Poor leadership will end up leading to a poor team. 
lack of accountability, not having accountability. If, for example, we, we, we have projects in IT, in the tech services, we work closely with you guys. There's an intake office in the project management office that Missy runs, okay? Once the project kicks off, I may need to go to Katie to deal with something on the data side. I may need some from Josh. I may need some from third party. I may need some from application, the database side. All through the life cycle of a project, somebody has to be accountable. And when you're not accountable, things happen on the opposite side. You get unintended consequences when you're not accountable. Teams fail when there's a lack of accountability. I have to be accountable to the next person beside me, all right? I got to be accountable to Charles Ash, okay? He's expecting me to do what I'm supposed to do in technical services. Director Ray is expecting us to do what we're supposed to do. We have $115 billion worth of assets to manage. Somebody has to be accountable. Accountability sets the environment for us to be able to collaborate, communicate, connect. Those kind of things don't happen without accountability. Next up is lack of trust. If you don't trust the person next to you, you're going to have problems on your team, okay? I asked Ron Lewis to set a screen. He didn't trust. So he decided to draw up a play that would never work anyway because it's six people. I'm still mad at that, okay? <laughs> really mad at that. I really wanted to win that game, you know? But he didn't trust. Lack of trust, all right? Lack of trust. But then you saw in the last clip, a guy who is now making $176 million handed the ball off to a guy who's not making $176 million to trust him. The number one draft pick that year was Greg Oden. The ball didn't go to Greg. It went to the other guy, all right? So you have to have a level of trust, but lack of trust will kill the team. Inability to deal with conflict, this is huge. We are, we are a team, okay? But if we don't have conflict management, we're going to fail. We're going to fail. I don't understand how you can roll out of the bed and come to work and just don't like somebody. I don't understand that. I really don't, all right? Or I want to sabotage what you do. Or I don't have anything nice to say about you. Or it's either my way or the highway. We're very diverse. Everybody's bringing great talent to the table. We have to harness that talent. And even in the situations where we may not agree, we can collectively uh, disagree in a way that still moves the team forward, okay? I may not agree with everything that the executive management staff wants to do. I don't know all of what they deal with. They may be making a decision based off what the governor's office said. Same thing with Charles. Charles Ash may have to make a decision by IT that you might not agree with, but you may not even know all of what he's dealing with or what he's been told. All right? But conflicts are going to come up. The biggest thing, though, is can you function as a team? Because, see, if I trust him, I know that he's got my best interest at heart. If I trust my teammate, I've got to trust that he's going to make, he or she's going to make that play. All right? So conflict's going to happen. But the inability to manage conflict will ruin a team. It will sink the ship. I'm a Navy guy. All right, the first time I ever met the pilots of the Blue Angels, and some of you may not have heard of Blue Angels, they're the guys that fly around and do the tricks. They're like the elite of the elite in terms of uh, naval aviators, all right? And the thing that I, uh, I took away from my meeting with those guys, first of all, every time they meet you and they shake your hand and you say, hey, how you doing? The first thing they always tell you, I'm happy to be here. And I kept hearing that over and over and over again. I'm happy to be here. They always talked about the fact of the people who always were at the towers, or on the aircraft carrier, doing their job. We called them the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the debt crew, okay? When I was on board the aircraft carrier, we had a debt crew. These were the people who would set the cables, set the launch, put the cables back. These are the people who were in harm's way all the time. They always talked about those people, all right? They were very complimentary of those people because it was part of a team. Conflict's going to come, but we have to have the ability to manage it. Lack of clear goals and purpose, all right? You have an organizational objective. We have a mission. We have a goal at ODOT. Charles Ash has one for IT. We have one in tech services. We have some in tech services. You have individual goals also, but collectively as a team, 
clear goals and purpose. Where are we going? What are we trying to achieve? Okay, that's very important because when you don't have that, you kind of tend to just kind of flounder around. All right, things don't really get done as well when we don't have a clear goal and a clear purpose. But when we do have purpose, it's easier to have a little bit more passion, a little bit more commitment and accountability. Why? Wow, I know where we're going. All right, so teams fail when they have a lack of clear goal and a lack of clear purpose, and then lack of inclusion. I have no idea sometimes, and I've seen it. Some of you have probably seen it when you've been around here. Why you don't include everybody? Everybody brings something to the table. You know, I've, I've been amazed in the last eight years as heading up tech services, the number of people I've come across who feel like they don't really add any value. Or they feel like, it's, you know, my little piece of the pie here, I just work on this, and that's it. It's because they have not been included, all right? And team members who are not included normally are the ones who erode the foundation of the team, believe it or not. Those are the ones that normally erode the foundation of the team. Why? They got time. They got time to gossip. They got time to tear stuff up. They got time to tear things down. They have to be included. Inclusion is very, very important in terms of a team. Even if it's the smallest job you got to do, include them. All right? Next up, um, for some of you folks who are Cleveland Cavalier fans, all right, LeBron James is gone, but I'm going to give you some nostalgia here. We're going to go back a little bit. Remember they won the championship in 2016. Everybody talked about Kyrie Irving, LeBron James, and what he did and all that kind of stuff. Everybody remember this play? He got that famous block at the end, you know, toward the end of the game. Outstanding. They talk about being a player of the game. Player of the game. My MVP for that series was a different person. This person, Tristan Thompson. He averaged 11 points, 12 rebounds a game, or 10 points, 12 rebounds a game in that, for that championship series. And my reason for picking him was every night, keep in mind, he averaged that. So every night he came to work. He wasn't getting the headlines. He wasn't hitting the game winner. He wasn't getting the fantastic block. He's not LeBron James. But every game, he came in there and got 12 rebounds, 10 points. If you take away his 10 points, if you would take away even two or three of his rebounds, they don't win a championship. Cleveland doesn't win a championship, right, Kathy? They won't win the championship, all right? And so when they interviewed him on the sideline, Doris Burke, sideline reporter extraordinaire, she asked Tristan about that. I don't know many guys, Tristan, who would embrace the dirty work you do on a nightly basis. Why? Why are you so able to embrace that role? Tristan responds and says, be a star in your own role. I love that. Be a star in your own role. Everybody's not LeBron James, only one of him. Everybody's not Kyrie Irving, it's only one of him. But the team, all right, that's how they won the championship. Be a star in your own role. I like to look at the championship team as a puzzle. Everyone has their role. Some have the role to score. Me, I have the role of doing the dirty work. Just be a star in your own role. I thought that was profound. He would have been my MVP. Why? He embraced his role. Some people didn't even look at it. The 10 points, 12 rebounds. If you took any portion of that puzzle away, like he described it, the puzzle is incomplete. The team is incomplete. The team would have failed, all right? They played the championship again this year. Tristan Thompson didn't get 10 points, 12 rebounds. I mean, 12 rebounds, 10 points, all right? People did not play their role. They ended up losing. But the championship, the success is a team. Everybody has a role on their team. Be a star in your own role. Everybody's not called to be the MVP, you know? If you want to be the MVP of the help desk, Maybe you want to be the sixth man on the serpentine, sixth man of the year on the serpentine. Maybe you want to be an all-star network person. But at the end of the day, why can't you just be a star in your own role? Bring that to the team. Everybody has something they can bring to the team. And with the team that we have here, you look at what we've done in the last eight years or so here at the Department of Transportation and where we're going. We've got a darn good team put together. And that's because people are starting to step up and be a star in their own role. Now I want to talk to you about why you matter. 
You matter, okay? And one of the reasons why Charles put this together was to highlight the fact that you all matter. Every one of you. I don't care if you've got 30 years, 5 years, 2 years, 35 years at ODOT. Everybody can bring something to the table. Everybody matters. All right? You heard Peter talk about the number of fatalities on our highway last year. 1,179. Trending in the same direction again this year. All right? Now, we can't control all of what happens when there's a fatality that happens, but the part that we can control, all right? If you're a database person and you're responsible for making sure that data is available, if you're a networking person or a person who manages the servers, or you're the help desk person, all right? Or you're a planning person, everybody has a role, you matter. I come to work, I tell my team in tech services all the time because we're the ones with the funky pimped out vans you saw back yesterday that collect all that data. Don't ever give me half an effort. Half an effort means that somebody maybe in your family is riding on an unsafe road, all right? When we don't collect skid tests, which tells us the ability for you to potentially not be able to grip the pavement and slide and rear, and rear end uh, into somebody, and we don't do what we're supposed to do, that jeopardizes you. That jeopardizes the traveling public. I'm passionate about what I do because I'm passionate about people. We have to do that. You matter because at the end of the day, you're the difference sometimes between a person getting from home to not getting home. Those chairs represent the, 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 the uh, 1,179 people who didn't make it home in 2017. You could potentially be the difference in that person making it home. I think about that all the time. Can somebody get around that particular curve? Can somebody get off, on and off the ramp? Are they gonna slide off the ramp? Are we collecting macro texture data that tells us the potential for hydroplaning so that we can alert people that this road might be unsafe and we can fix it quicker? Can I get the engineers better information so they can design better? Can I get the programmers better information so they can code better products? Can I talk to the industry about the products they have, okay, that might be able to help us bring that number down? You matter. Don't sell yourself short. You do matter. The other one I want to bring up, and I just dealt with this uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Ian Kidner and I, uh, Ian who uh, oversees our road inventory group and our GIS group, uh, we have a project called Location-Based Response System. It's a 911. Uh, program that was done some 10 years ago, and we're redoing it right now. We have some counties right now who are not involved with that. We're trying to help support a statewide 911 initiative that, uh, that uh, DAS is, uh, uh, and OIT is actually working on, okay? But there was a young kid down in Cincinnati, you probably heard about the kid, 16 years old. He got trapped in a Honda minivan in between the seat, 16 years old. He voice command to call 911 because he was trapped. He talked to the dispatcher and said, hey, I'm stuck, can't get out. At first, some people kind of thought that, man, not sure if it's real, couldn't get the location because he was, he was stuck, all right? He called back again, I'm stuck, I feel like I'm dying. Tell my mother I love her, okay? Couldn't find it. They could not find the kid. Location-based re uh, response system identifies every address along a roadway. We're getting every address along a roadway in every county, all 88 counties, trying to make it better, all right? And you can bet your bottom dollar, we're gonna do the job to the best of our ability. The 911 system, to a certain degree, failed. Not any individual, I'm not putting that on any individual, because I know the dispatcher feels bad. The police officers who couldn't find him feel bad. That young man should be in school right now. That could be your kid. Okay? So again, you matter. Because why? Our location referencing system at ODOT is the foundation of which all other systems sit on top of. Whether you're developing a project, whether you're trying to identify a crash, or potential areas of safety issues, it sits on top of that. IT and the folks in IT, you play a very, very huge and valid role in making sure that that system functions the way it's supposed to function. Are we clearing all the snow and ice off the road to make sure the traveling public is safe? You matter, folks. Make sure you do not underestimate your value to the team. No matter how big or small the contribution is, you matter. That young man should still be here in the classroom today. 
Somewhere along the line, there was a failure in the system. So when we started talking about trying to make sure we're doing our job and doing it to the best of our ability, leadership requires passion. And passion requires you to be concerned about somebody other than yourself, okay? The other one I'm gonna bring up is a personal one to me. Now, my wife, um, about 12 years ago, brought home a kid, all right? Brought home a little baby, all right? Now, I'd already had two sons. We had decided before we got married, we were gonna have two kids. I decided to wait till a Friday during football season, decided to go to the hospital, get that taken care of so I don't have no more kids. <laughs> had my frozen peas and sitting down watching the Buckeye game for the weekend, I was in hog heaven. Well, that winter, she decided to bring a kid home. We were both licensed um, uh, child care advocates. Like I told you, I'm passionate about kids. So she brought a kid home. Now, this is not the picture of my kid on this picture right here, but she brought a baby home. I came home from coaching the game. There's a baby in the crib. <laughs> All right? For three days later, I'm sitting around like, I don't even know if it's a girl or boy. She said, change the diaper. I opened the diaper. He peed on me. It's a boy. All right? It's a boy, okay? Just kind of show you how, illustrate again why you matter, all right? So ask her some questions about the little kid. Normally they stay with us about 30 days. This particular kid was born with crack cocaine in his system, all right? And you know, when you're a child care advocate, you deal with some terrible stuff. You see some terrible stuff. If you talk to our frontline people that old out, our maintenance crews every day, who ride them down the roadway, risk their life every day on the roadways, they see some terrible stuff up and down the roadways. This is a terrible thing. The number of kids that are born with crack cocaine or other uh, types of drugs in their system. This particular little boy had that same issue, okay? Now, roll forward 12 years later. That's what he looks like right now. Now, I'm not putting that up there to try to get a pat on the back. Again, I don't wanna be father of the year. The best compliment that you can get as a teammate it's not, again, that you're the MVP of the help desk. Not that you're the sixth man or woman of the year of the server team. Not that you're father of the year. The best compliment that you can ever receive is that you were a darn good teammate. Because that means a lot. For all those different things that I put up here in that presentation so far, that you're a darn good team. You understand your value. You understand that you have passion. You understand that you're here for something larger than you. You're making an impact. You bring something to the table. You matter, all right? I had no idea what I was going to do with a crack-infested kid. I'm sitting there and thinking he's going to probably have handicaps and things like that. Going back and forth to the, uh, the courthouse to try to see if he can get him back to his family. I had no idea I was going to end up with another kid. Didn't know what I was going to do with him. So what you, we had to make a decision. You decide to do what you have to do. You matter. It's something larger than me. It's not about me, all right? It's not about my ego, not about my status and all that kind of stuff, but it is about what I can affect and make a change on, as we can as a team. We can make that kind of change. So 12 years later, when I'm looking at that picture last week down in Cincinnati, him winning the championship, and I look at this kid, I'm like, wow, what a difference 12 years make. I don't know if there's any issues that he may ever deal with because of how he was born. All I know is that the environment that he's grown up in, and I give major credit to my wife, but the environment that he's been able to grow up in, I haven't seen any issues of crack cocaine. So you matter. And sometimes, folks, you matter when you don't even know it. So I'm telling you as a team, collectively as the folks in this room, that we should be charged up about where we're going in the 21st century. We've got some major, major obstacles coming our way in terms of funding shortfalls. And we've got major retirements and things like that. But we are resilient. We're nimble, we're flexible, and we're solid professionals. And collectively as a team, there's no more I do it, planning, tech services, structures, pavement engineering, and on and on and on. It's one ODOT. It's our ODOT team. And you're the ones that represent that. And the last thing I'm gonna leave you with, the thing that truly separates good leaders from great ones starts with the simple three-level word, why? Ask yourself sometime about that question, why? Why do you do what you do? Because that will explain a lot of things. If it's just collecting a paycheck, you're probably gonna be that teammate that I talked about that we don't want, okay? 
But if you can figure out what motivates you, if you can figure out the impact that you make, your significance to the team, the value that you bring, the impact that you have, the ability, think about it, 5.5 million people go to work every day relying on something that you do as a team. Why? Why do I do what I do? When you come to a point where you can answer the question of why, you have defied all logic in terms of being a great leader and a great teammate. I love working with you folks because of what you bring to the table. I love working with you because of the impact that you have. I love working with you because of the value that you add to this state and to this country. So with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Charles Ash, but make sure you understand one thing. You matter. That's great stuff. All right. So there's a whole bunch of speakers that uh, we have not yet recognized. Uh, so before we leave, can anyone who has not received uh, the gift, who is a speaker, please come up here, including you two. So all speakers, uh, there are speakers at least from this morning who have not been recognized, uh, and there are probably some from yesterday afternoon also. So thanks to all these speakers, you guys can head out. I just have a thank you all. Before we go, I want to make sure that you understood that you were all beta testers this weekend or during this conference. Uh, if you haven't noticed, the badge that you have, if you still have it, is now void. Uh, it's a piece of technology that we're trying for uh, being able to get people into an authenticated building, central office, or your district buildings, and make sure that they aren't coming back with one of our badges after the day that they're authorized to be there. So the, the void should have bled through your label and it should be voided now. Uh, the software that we use to print the badges that were printed uh, is also a test case for a facility. So uh, didn't go exactly as planned, but the, the badge part actually worked out pretty well. So thank you for being beta testers. Now, there's a whole lot of people that I need to thank, uh, because without them, this would not have happened. Uh, so all the way from Director Ray, uh, Assistant Directors March, Banks, Simpson, and McAdam, uh, we had their full support to do this. Uh, but before them, uh, strange as it may seem, the first people I asked uh, as to whether or not they would support this are the BHRAs. I asked them uh, because uh, it's hyper important that the district people are going to be authorized to come here. And when I asked them if it would be all right to come, the first question was, well, you just mean the NAS, right? And I said, hmm, not really. I want them all. Uh, 
They said, well, what are we gonna do for IT support? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, we'll try to make sure you have support, we'll figure something out, will you let them come? And they said yes. Uh, so thank you to all the BHRAs first. Thank you to all the deputy directors, including the district deputy directors. Uh, without their support, this, this could not have happened. Uh, I wanna thank uh, all of the IT, of course, but really thanks to all of the people in planning, in uh, CAD mapping, in traffic. Those groups are the three groups that we probably work most closely with from an IT perspective. There are some others that, uh, that we'll probably wanna bring in next year, if we're gonna do this next year. Do you think we should do this next year? Yes. All right. So, thank you to those divisions in particular. Um, I also wanna thank uh, John Puente and Ian uh, gave us some people. Uh, these three people in particular, Mike Weekly, uh, Drade Snyder, and Yancey Wessel, they were awesome at helping put together the technology in the rooms. They do this for OTEC and some other conferences, so thank you specifically to those three guys uh, for all the things that they did. Um, I want to thank all of the district IT managers uh, because after I asked the BHRAs if I could do it, I asked the districts if they were supportive of it. I know that seems backward, but that's actually the way I did it. Uh, so thank you to all of the IT managers out there. Uh, it's, I appreciate your support. Thank you to all of the IT managers at central office and in the districts. They paid for the food, right? We, we put the food together. Uh, they paid for all of that, all the water, all that stuff. So thank you to all of the IT managers across the state. Uh, a special, uh, so you know that there are people in here that have these orange t-shirts on. Those were our, and not all the volunteers had orange shirts, but most of them did. Uh, those are our volunteers. Uh, it's Brandon, Robin, Pennywood Raby, uh, John Puente, Mike Lovins, Mike Dots, Heather Roberts, Bill Groves, Ed Thomas, Louis Sewell, Drade Snyder, Yancey Wessel, Eric Pothest, uh, Belinda Moselle, Missy Anvers, Crystal Beacom, Mike Hagler, and Larry Wright. Uh, thank you to all of those volunteers. Could not have done it without you. Uh, and there's one other person, and that is Robin Traxler. There is no way that this would have happened without all of uh, Robin's efforts. I gotta tell you, Robin is, uh, she's dogged in her determination when she gets a project, okay? This is a good thing and it's a bad thing simultaneously. <laughs> so you get it and you're glad that she's doing it until you're the target. <laughs> and when you're holding up things, holy mackerel. Don't be that guy. All right, so, so the, during the last two days, uh, Endpoint Computing Team issued a 10,000 minute challenge, right? So think about how you might be able to do that. Uh, we're, there's a whole bunch of new technology that's coming here. Uh, we don't have any experience doing it. Uh, we're gonna have some help. We're gonna have some partners doing some of this stuff. Uh, but really, uh, I mean, the tech services group is leading the charge for data governance it's gonna help the foundational elements of those things that I was speaking about in my vision yesterday. Data governance is gonna play a part. The ITSM is gonna play a significant part. All of these little pieces of the puzzle of the technology stack, they're all gonna play a part. And I don't care how long you have to work here. If you have a year left before retirement, if you've got one month in under your belt, you have an opportunity to become a part of these solutions and lead. Just like Drew was just saying, my saying is slightly different. I say be a leader wherever you are. Help us, help ODOT, uh, get better. Thank you, and we'll see you next year. <laughs>